Comcast vowing to spend $100 million over the next three years in order to help fight racism and injustice. Today, I'm proud to announce Apple's racial equity and justice initiative with a $100 million commitment. Walmart and the Walmart Foundation are committing $100 million to create a new center on racial equity. The NBA Foundation, which will donate more than $300 million to black social and economic causes. Nike revealing that Michael Jordan and the Jordan brand will be donating $100 million to organizations dedicated to ensuring racial equality. Greetings, and welcome to the Wharton School Beyond Business. Our session today is about race and corporate power, where we will explore the financial, operational, and strategic commitments firms have made to combat systemic racism challenging the black community. I am thrilled to be joined on this virtual stage by my new and old friends. Please join me in welcoming Carla Harris, Vice Chair and Managing Director at Morgan Stanley, Wes Moore, CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, Delilah Wilson-Scott, Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for the Comcast Corporation, and my University of Pennsylvania colleague, Kat Roschetta, also a Wharton graduate from the class of 2001. She's Founding Executive Director of the Center for High Impact Philanthropy. We will be uh, welcoming questions throughout this session, so we invite you, as you hear things that are meaningful and, and impactful to you, to submit your questions through the chat feature. Kat will organize the Q&A discussion later in the, in the program. I'd like to begin, Carla, actually, with a question for you first. You began your career at Morgan Stanley 33 years ago as an investment banker. How would you say that the industry has evolved over the years in terms of its attention and focus on matters of diversity? And how has your own role and relationship to Morgan Stanley changed across that time period? Well, first of all, Dean Jane, thank you so much for having me as a part of this conversation, this important conversation. Uh, and I am really honored to be uh, here with both Wes and Delilah and, and you. So. Let's talk about how diversity has changed on the street and let's talk about how it's changed at Morgan Stanley. I will tell you, when I started in 1987, it really wasn't a conversation or, frankly, a word that you heard a lot on the street. And it certainly wasn't a word I heard a lot during the walls. But it was around 1990 that I would argue that corporate America and around 91, 92, where Wall Street started to have the conversation and the word diversity was used. That was the first time you started to see diversity training. That was the first time people started thinking about programs to enhance diversity and having partnerships and collaborations with some of the historically black colleges, for example, and other institutions where they could actually source a great pipeline. But I would argue that back in the early 90s for corporate America and for Wall Street, frankly, uh, people thought about diversity as the right thing to do or the moral thing to do. And people really didn't think about it from a commercial aspect. I would say fast forward now 30 plus years, people are starting to really think that it, it is a part of the strategy. It is a part of being able to innovate. It is a part of any organization's future. But we're at the early days of people really starting to embrace that you got to think about diversity, inclusion, and equity as a necessity in the strategy and a necessity for you to win in whatever industry that you're in. And with respect to my relationship, I have been involved with diversity at the first awakening, if you will. I was on the ground floor when we created the Richard B. Fisher Scholars Program, along with two other women of color, uh, as we actually put pen to paper to create that program, which was our first program to five historically black colleges. And I have been involved, whether it's been recruiting or mentoring or sponsoring, and certainly using my voice on behalf of diversity and inclusion for the last 30 years, and have been a part of how the firm has evolved even in the last eight months around <laughs> significant programs with respect to 
scholarships at historically black colleges, enhancing our pipeline programs, uh, certainly supporting black banks, doing what we have been able to do with the Multicultural Innovation Lab, with our podcast, elevating the discussion about the inequity of the distribution uh, of capital to women and multicultural entrepreneurs. So I, I am happy to say that I've been a part of the conversation and the evolution over the last 30 years. I can certainly testify to that as someone who has watched your career over at least the past 20. Every year, there's more and more and more that you're doing, not only with Morgan Stanley, but as you say, on the street. So we thank you for that effort. Tell me more about what Morgan Stanley is doing with respect to the multicultural uh, lab initiative that, that you have started and has been so wildly successful. How is that seen as a way of contributing to some of the challenges and issues around racial, racial justice? Yes, absolutely. It, it is one of the, the sources of my pride and joy, I will tell you, that the Multicultural Innovation Lab was born four years ago, and it really was born to try to close the gap in the inequity of distribution of capital to women and multicultural entrepreneurs. Because as you know, women get less than 4% of all VC dollars and people of color get less than 2%, depending on your source. Some sources say 1%. And this doesn't make any sense. I mean, that is a gross inequity in the marketplace. And whenever you have that kind of market inefficiency, as I like to say, there's a huge commercial opportunity. And most investors like to go where other people aren't because they think they're going to get an outsized return. Well, interestingly enough, that definition still does hold in this case because these entrepreneurs are resilient. To Wes's point, we have found that those who are have been in the middle of the problem have the best solutions, the most sustainable solutions, the most competitive solutions. And that's certainly what we have seen with these entrepreneurs. So we created the lab and it is an in-house accelerator like any market accelerator that you know. And we give these entrepreneurs three things. We give them cash uh, in exchange for a single digit percentage of the company like any other accelerator in the market. We give them six months of content that is specifically designed to help them to evolve from being a founder to a CEO, because you know there is a difference. And we also give them connections to some of our largest investment banking clients to advance the scale of their growth. And, and I will tell you that most VC stats, uh, to, to use Wes and, and talking about the data, the data of what venture capitalists will tell you that one out of 10 work. Well, we've had a far different statistic We've had five for five in our first class. In our next class, we probably had one, one um, that, you know, looks like it's on a stretcher now. In the third class, maybe one that may not make it out of COVID. But in the fourth class, all of the companies are thriving. So you have one out of nine or 10 that doesn't work versus the industry average where only one out of 10 does work, that tells you something. You know, yes, you can argue that we can pick them, but my point is it's not a scale, it's not a, it's not a, a supply issue. These companies are out there and not only are we uh, operating the lab, but what we're also doing is elevating the stories around the inequity of the distribution of capital and how entrepreneurs have been successful in accessing that capital through the podcast. And with the podcast, what we're trying to do is to put a playbook out there. So if you're an entrepreneur, then maybe you want to listen to, you know, a rich dentist talk about how he raised money, you know, with Sundial, or, or maybe you want to talk about a Doug song and how he sold his business for a few billion dollars to Cisco. Or if you are, uh, happen to be a city treasurer or someone that runs the economic development, uh, business in your city, you might want to listen to Kevin Warren talk about how he created a very effective public-private partnership to get a billion-dollar stadium built in Minnesota that, gener that then generated $3 billion of capital in that same geographic area. So that's part of what we're trying to do to close this inequity of the distribution and to eradicate the I can't find any or I'm not sure how we can get this done. 